Rubina. And I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary My Dear. Where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. So welcome back to our series on utero health and today we're talking about menopause. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss one of our videos. I want to give a really special shout out to Erica, my childhood friend's mom, uh, for suggesting this topic and we love hearing from our audience and getting um, suggestions for people. So if you have anything for us, feel free to DM us or put it in the comments. Um, yeah, let us know what you want to learn about. Yeah, that suggestion actually inspired this entire series. So menopause, that's a crazy time. It really does sound like a crazy time. And I think there's a lot of like taboo and like fear around menopause and like the way we discuss it. Actually, like preparing for this video, it was kind of, I don't want to say sad, but it made me really realize like how many people in my life were probably going through hard times experiencing a lot of symptoms of menopause and just kind of maybe suffering in silence through it. Yeah, I think that taboo really stops people from talking about some of the really hard symptoms that, that people go through as they're transitioning into, you know, postmenopausal times. So maybe we should get some like definitions out of yeah. the way in the beginning. So Honestly, definitions, <laughs> so confusing. Very confusing. I realized I thought I knew what menopause was, but I... Didn't. Yeah, we were just talking about this before we started filming. I was like, I don't know if I'm the like only idiot around here, but I definitely misunderstood what the actual term mm -hmm. menopause means. So it turns out menopause is specifically like the point in time, 12 months after the last period. And you know, the period leading up to menopause where you're going through like a lot of the symptoms that you might have heard about, things like hot flashes and you know, all the uncomfortable symptoms, that's called perimenopause or menopausal transition. And then after that point in time, you're postmenopausal. You hit postmenopause. Yeah. So, so menopause is just a point in time. After, you know, you've um, gone through that, uh, you know, you've stopped your period for 12 months, um, then you are postmenopausal. And I think that like demarcation there is to kind of show like the changes in hormones that happen um, as you hit that point. Perimenopause typically starts between the ages of 45 and 55, and it can last an average of four years. Which honestly is a lot longer than I thought. We were actually talking about this as well before we began. And I think this also speaks to how no one really talks uh -huh. about it. I mean, I, again, maybe this is just my own ignorance, but I kind of thought it was just like a few week process. I know, and like, you know, we do like a whole class on like nutrition through the lifespan. And like, I feel like we're covered kind of menopause. Like, Gloss the words. It's like, okay, so then you have your baby, then you lactate, and then you continue being like a regular and functioning human of sight, and then you basically die. <laughs> you just get all, you're just lumped into older adults. It is a really important transition period in life, and I think it's something that hopefully, uh, as we progress in our society, will be talked about more often. Absolutely, because there's so many physiological changes that mm -hmm. happen during that time. Like our main um, hormones, like estrogen and progesterone, those levels vary a lot during that perimenopausal time. Mm -hmm. Um, our bones tend to become more brittle or less dense during that time as well. So throughout today's video, we're going to talk about four major nutrition concerns that happen during the menopause time. Um, the first one's going to be insulin resistance. Then we have osteoporosis and bone health. Sarcopenia, which is like a fancy word for muscle, the amount of muscle you have and, you know, muscle reductions that happen as you age, as well as, you know, um, how to manage some of those symptoms that happen during the period of perimenopause. So let's start off with insulin resistance, let's do which it. is something that, you know, a lot of people experience when they get, go through that perimenopause and menopausal stage. And that's basically your body becomes less good at responding to the insulin that your body's releasing. So what that means is that a lot of times your blood sugar levels will be higher, your insulin levels will be higher, and that does put you at higher risk for things like diabetes and weight gain, actually. As we see these changes in hormones that produce, uh, that result in your body becoming less responsive to insulin, and insulin's that hormone that kind of tells your cells, hey, let the glucose in. Um, as we see that happen, it's really important to focus on having a healthy, um, varied diet, rich in whole grains, fruits and vegetables, um, and good sources of fiber, as well as 
uh, healthy fats. Additionally, exercise is really important if you are concerned about insulin resistance because exercise helps your cells bring glucose in without insulin. So, you know, um, with insulin resistance, we're concerned about having elevated blood glucose levels. So if you're exercising more frequently, you know, you can bring glucose um, in without insulin and the effects of exercise, if you're getting a moderate intensity exercise in, can actually last up to 24 hours. So daily exercise, we recommend it to everyone, but especially important if you're going um, through menopause. So another really big nutrition concern for people going through menopause is osteoporosis, um, which is basically a progressive disorder where you're kinda, your bones kind of slowly lose their mass over time and kind of increase your risk for things like fractures. And this is something that's really important because you know our bone health, they very much contribute to our quality of life and being able to just do our day-to-day -day activities mm -hmm. independently. As we get into um, a lot, like much older adulthood, you know, having fractures can actually lead to significant, you know, disability as well as can be a risk factor for morbidity and mortality. So we want to keep our bones as strong and as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Yeah, and it's interesting because for this age group, actually the risk of like fragility related fractures is actually higher than that of breast cancer. So the nutrients that we want to be especially mindful of to kind of help preserve our bone density are things like calcium and vitamin D, as well as prioritizing physical activity. Calcium uh, is an important component of bones and when you don't have enough calcium in your body, because calcium is also used for other things, your, your bones act as kind of a reserve for the calcium. So they're there to provide structure but also act as a reserve so your body will start to strip away the calcium from your bones to prioritize for other things. So it's important that you're getting enough calcium in. There's also vitamin D which helps with the absorption of calcium. Vitamin D is the supportive friend to calcium. You know, where there's calcium, there should also be vitamin D. So as we said, calcium kind of contributes to the structural integrity of our bones and they're actually like embedded in the collagen inside our bones, which is why they're really important. Yeah, and your calcium needs go up actually for from a thousand milligrams a day to 1200 milligrams a day. Looking for dietary sources of calcium, um, a lot of people know you find a lot of calcium in dairy products. So that's milk, cheese, yogurt, kefir. Let us know if we miss anything. Let us know what your favorite dairy products are. Um, you can also uh, find calcium in certain uh, leafy greens like bok choy. Another good source of dietary calcium is tofu that has been um, set using um, calcium. So that will typically say on the packaging. Also, there are lots of milk substitute beverages, you know, um, soy milk, uh, some almond milks, oat milks, hemp milks, whatever kind of plant-based milk you like a lot. There are some uh, versions of those that do contain calcium. So make sure you're looking at the um, nutrient facts table and seeing if it is a source of calcium because it will be on there. So if you're concerned about your calcium intake through food, supplementation is definitely a great option. And supplementing with calcium has been shown to improve things like bone mineral density and reduce the risk of fractures. Uh, just make sure you're choosing a calcium supplement that has vitamin D in it or that you're also supplementing with vitamin D separately because vitamin D is an important thing that you need to help absorb the calcium. So I guess from here we can move on to the needs of vitamin D in this population. Um, so the RDA for vitamin D um, for after menopause is 600 IUs per day. Up to the age of 70 years. And after the age of 70, the needs actually go up to 800 IUs per day. A lot of people think vitamin D and they think the sunshine vitamin and you're gonna produce that um, through your exposure to the sun. But if you're living in a Northern hemisphere like we do, a lot of the time you're not really able to uh, get enough vitamin D or from sun exposure. So, you know, getting it through your diet is really important. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of food sources with vitamin D either, especially like in the North American context. Natural sources include things like egg yolks and fatty fish, um, dairy, uh, dairy milk and margarine are also fortified with vitamin D. Um, and I think even though it's not required to be fortified, um, like a lot of the plant-based beverages do have vitamin D as well. But again, just keep an eye out on the label because 
they're not required to add that in. For people above the age of 50, Health Kennedy, uh, Health Canada, Health Kennedy, <laughs> Health, Kennedy <laughs> Health Canada actually does recommend taking a vitamin D supplement. And this may be surprising, but protein is actually really important for bone health as well. Protein actually makes up 50% of the volume of bones and a third of its mass. And we talked about the, the, the calcium is what we associate with bones, but that's inside of the collagen matrix and that collagen is protein. protein. And as you get older, actually our bodies have a harder time um, utilizing the protein is called anabolic resistance. So that's why it's actually thought that older adults actually need more protein than younger adults. Even though the RDA, which is what's recommended by, you know, the Canadian and American health officials uh, for older adults remains at 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, we uh, have seen uh, lots of recommendations from societies uh, that are related to osteoporosis and is the health of older adults that actually recommend um, intakes around one gram per kilogram to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And actually there are certain um, studies that suggest even higher amounts as well. So, um, you know, after menopause, it's really important to prioritize uh, protein for your bone health. Yeah, and studies do show that, you know, people that take in more protein than the 0.8 grams per kilogram per day tend to have higher bone mineral density, um, slower rate of loss, as well as lower risk of fractures. So those are the dietary components, but there are certain lifestyle components that, um, you know, are often recommended when talking about improving and maintaining bone density and bone health uh, after menopause. The first one is so smoking cessation. So quit smoking. And I'm sure anyone who does smoke is like, yeah, I've heard that's the first time I heard that one. But that can help maintain bone health um, and also to limit alcohol consumption. And the third one, and you may not like hearing this, but exercise actually is really important for bone health, especially weight bearing exercises. So things like running and dancing or, you know, resistance training, things like lifting weights, all of those things actually really help preserve your bones. Honestly, I love exercise. So I hope people don't hate hearing about it. And, you know, honestly, great way to be, to stay social and to keep socials, you know? go to a class or something or like exercise with your friends. So that's how to keep your bones healthy. But what about your muscles? This is a bit of a bummer, but muscle loss as you get older is actually really common and it even has a name. It's called sarcopenia. Sounds a lot more fun than it is. Yeah. And it's, I, you know, similar to, you know, your, the bone structural integrity, you know, with muscle loss that can compromise your quality of life and, you know, having the ability to do your day-to-day -day activities independently. So I think prioritizing maintaining that muscle mass is really important. And you know, I feel like we're talking right now and it sounds like we're talking about like really, really old people. Like I don't, and I don't want like people to be watching this and be like, I'm only like 53. Um, but you know, like because we see these changes in hormones, we also see these uh, changes in uh, muscle and bone. So we're trying to, you know, make sure that during that period we're setting ourselves up or I guess like people who are going through menopause are setting themselves up to be healthy in older, older adulthood. So please know that we don't, we know you don't have like one foot in the grave just because you <laughs> you're, you're in menopause now. I just want to make that clear. But yeah, exactly. Sarcopenia, it's the loss of muscle mass and having good muscle mass is important for being able to function uh, on the day to day and keeping good muscle mass you know, into older adult head is very important. So this may be intuitive for a lot of people, but protein intake is actually really important to help maintain that muscle mass. And like we said, um, a lot of, you know, even like organizations in Europe actually do recommend that older adults take a greater amount of protein in than younger adults. And so please check out our videos about um, protein to learn more about good sources of protein and high quality proteins. The second aspect of maintaining um, muscle mass is exercise, which, you know, pretty surprise, surprise. There. And you know what's a good thing though? It's like you kind of kill two birds with one stone. You're protecting your bones and you're protecting your muscles all by doing, eating protein and doing exercise. So that's good. That doesn't mean that you need to go out and like spend a lot of money on an expensive gym membership or anything. There's a lot of, you know, body weighted resistance training that you can do. Um, you can get, you know, resistance bands and things for relatively cheap mm -hmm. and just work out at home as well. And just doing those types of activities a few times a week can 
go a long way and help preserving that muscle mass. Now, I think we're gonna move on to, I think what most people wanna know when it comes to you know nutrition and menopause is how to manage those not so nice symptoms. Um, and the list is very expansive in terms of all the things that your body does during the period of perimenopause. I think hot flashes and night sweats tend to be two ones that maybe is most commonly mm -hmm. known, but things like breast tenderness, uh, tiredness, mood swings. Yeah. What else was there? there was a, the list was long. Um, a lot of things to do with like sexual dysfunction. Vaginal um, dryness. Yeah. There was also, um, you know, depression around the time of uh, menopause and perimenopause is also not uncommon as well. Um, we'll put up a full list of the symptoms on here and it's quite extensive. Almost as extensive as our PMS. As the PMS. <laughs> We'll get another scroll going. So you might be wondering how you can help tackle some of those, you know, less than ideal symptoms. And interestingly, there's actually a bunch of research on phytoestrogens specifically. Phytoestrogens are kind of estrogen analogs. So that means that they look similar to estrogen that is found in plants. And uh, typically we think of soy when we think of phytoestrogens. The important thing to know though, is just because it looks like Estrogen doesn't mean it works exactly the same same way. It just means that it can kind of fit into some of those same receptors and uh, in your body. So there are different types of phytoestrogens, and phytoestrogens are found naturally in some foods. So things like soybeans, tofu, tempeh, soy beverages, as well as a few other foods as well. And it's super interesting because research does seem to show that when it comes to postmenopausal depressive symptoms. Phytoestrogens actually seem to help with that, especially at dosages between 25 milligrams and 100 milligrams. In the meta-analysis that was used to look at the effects of phytoestrogens on uh, menopausal depressive symptoms, it was actually found that every type of um, phytoestrogen uh, produced a benefit. So there was no one that produced a bigger benefit than another. However, if you are uh, experiencing severe symptoms of depression or severe mood strings, that is definitely something to bring up um, to your doctor as um, the extent of the effect of phytoestrogens may not be as strong as some of the other options that are out there. So hot flashes. I think that these are the kind of symptom that is like synonymous with menopause. I'm really not looking forward to having to go through that. I hate mm -hmm. sweating and that, just that discomfort of feeling hot. But luckily, there uh, is quite a bit of evidence that shows that phytoestrogens um, may be helpful in reducing the number of hot flashes that someone experiences during menopause. So there was a Cochrane review that uh, looked at phytoestrogens for um, hot flashes, and they found that one particular type called genistein, that might be wrong, but I tried my best. We Googled how to pronounce that. I think that's right. We're going to go we'll with that. We'll trust Google. Genistein is actually helpful in reducing um, hot flash uh, occurrence in menopausal women. So this doesn't mean that you take this uh, as a supplement, because then this was a supplemental form. You're not going to have any hot flashes. It just reduces the uh, frequency. But there's also other evidence um, from other meta-analyses that find that soy isoflavones that are also helpful for reducing um, the frequency of hot flashes. I do wanna point out though, that in um, these studies, they do find that the amount of time that it takes to work is a lot longer for phytoestrogens as it is for the synthetic drugs, so like uh, estradiol, for example, and the amount of benefit is less. So, you know, if you aren't going to consider, um, you know, taking estradiol, Phytoestrogens might be a, a good option, um, but you know if your symptoms are really bad and hard to manage, you know talk to your doctor about what all your options are. So all in all, if you're going through perimenopause or are postmenopausal, you know I think it's important to prioritize things like calcium, vitamin D, and protein, as well as see if you can add a little bit of exercise to your days. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video. Uh, and make sure you follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye. Bye.